Good morning. I'm Greg Lindsay. Uh, I'll be moderating this session. But first, a few remarks here. Obviously, you know the, 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 uh, the drill for questions. We'll be taking questions for this. Um, hopefully, the slides are synced up here. You've already seen in Gil's presentation uh, this image, uh, which was prepared by the office of one of our panelists, Marichelle. Uh, this is, of course, an image from Nelson Nygaard, Perkins and & Will, and Lyft, proposing how we could think of using autonomous vehicles to reshape our streets. And we have several other images that have been proposed here. Um, <laughs> I had the pleasure of having Gil in the audience at a conference several years ago at the Googleplex, uh, where, of course, uh, Google was discussing its autonomous vehicle research. And Astro Teller, the captain of Moonshots, who then headed the program, got up and gave one of the craziest talks about the future cities I've ever seen. He said things like, the city of Paris is not the city of the future. That it has not yet been built to receive our technologies. And sure enough, of course, Google is now building a city from scratch, or part of one in Toronto, uh, that will be designed in part for autonomous cars. Gil, who was in the audience that day, nearly had an aneurysm at part of this talk. And you can, now that you've seen his impassioned speech on this, you can see why. Um, we're going to talk a bit about today about you know, aligning the reality of autonomous vehicles and how they'll be implemented with some of these images about what we could do with cities. I've done work with the Bloomberg Philanthropies and Aspen Institute on working with public transport officials and mayors on thinking about how autonomous vehicles could be the Trojan horses to achieve the changes in cities we want. In theory, they could allow us to basically strip vehicles and dedicated lane space out of cities to flexibly redeploy public space. Of course, the reality isn't proving to live up to that. Um, you know, we have the spectacle of, of things like, for example, the fatal accident involving Uber in, in greater Phoenix, uh, Arizona. Um, that was a case where the pedestrian who was killed was walking outside of a crosswalk across a six-lane road, one of the wide open roads that Arizona Governor Doug Ducey cited when he welcomed autonomous vehicle testing to the state. So was it the autonomous vehicle that killed her, or was it partly to their road design? Um, also, you know, we see these sort of paradoxes all the time about thinking about how AVs will play into this. Um, I also think of Andrew Ng, who's a researcher on autonomous vehicles, who noted recently that because of setbacks in AV research, we may need to train pedestrians to essentially never jaywalk again. Let's think about this, New Yorkers. <laughs> and again, this promises that we would design vehicles that would, for, that would basically end pedestrian and traffic fatalities as we know it, that would allow us to flexibly reuse streets. Well, now we're seeing the scientists basically say, we're going to have to change human nature to fit the vehicles. We, know this story. It played out in every city around the country except ours. And even then, again, it played a, it played a role in ours in reshaping the city. Where, of course, you know, 40% of public transit trips in the entire United States happen here in New York. So with that, I'm, joined, I'm, I'm honored to be joined by such a fantastic group of panelists. No members of the automakers are here. No one from a technology company. Finally, a conversation by people who put cities first and know enough about autonomous vehicles to know what is hype and what is reality. So with that, I'm going to sit down and introduce my panelists. Thank you for the applause for my panelists. They deserve it more than I do. <laughs> Quick introductions going from left to right, and we'll get started. To my immediate left is Shinpei Sei, who's the executive director of the Gale Institute. Uh, Gale is, found, is named after Jan Gale, of course, the Copenhagen architect, uh, who has uh, helped inspire our former transport commissioner, Jeanette Sidi Khan, into pedestrianizing Times Square. Um, Shinpei, before that, was also at Transit Center, so excellent duality here of mobility and the city. Uh, to her immediate left is uh, Adam Lubinsky, who's the managing principal of WXY here in New York, the architecture and urban planning firm uh, that's worked on so many great visions. My favorite at the moment is the Brooklyn Strand, about rethinking the entire entrance of Brooklyn over the bridge. Um, to his left is Sabina Ufer, who is the the global head of cities research at Bureau Happel, the engineering firm. She's literally led workshops all over the world and thinking about how autonomous vehicles could redesign cities for good, which we'll come to. I've been lucky to participate in one. And then finally, we have Marichelle Font, uh, who is the principal of Nelson Nygaard, as discussed with the Lyft project, uh, and then has, of course, worked in Barcelona and elsewhere, which Gil showed in some of his slides. So I guess this is the first question. Marichal, let's start with you, since we've now seen twice a slide from that project. I don't know if you personally worked on it, because that was out of the West Coast office. Um, but I was hoping you could talk a bit about that, about you know, the, if you know about the sort of um, start of that project. Lyft, of course, and others have promoted you know, shared autonomous electric vehicles as a way of solving our congestion issues, solving some of the carbon issues, um, but also to promote you know, why we should allow them to actually have autonomous vehicles in cities. So um, what would it take to actually achieve that vision? And I don't know if we can, I left it up at the slide here. We'll see if we can so cycle back through does, to it. But um, the or not. Does this work? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So that project was a partnership with uh, Lyft. Uh, it was spelled, uh, Perkins and Will, Nelson Niger, and then we also, in, with collaboration with SCAC and a 100-hour campaign. So basically, the city of LA, as uh, most of you may know, uh, they have a problem with the congestion. Uh, and the mode share of, We've heard. of, of uh, solo drivers is like almost 70% or 60% at that point. 
So we looked at the uh, Wiltshire Boulevard, who is a very a busy, a busy road. And what happens now is that road brings about 30,000 vehicles and most of, of these, sorry, 30, 000, has the capacity of 30,000 30, trips. Uh, but and half of that are pedestrians. But if you see the space dedicated to pedestrians, which is really it's less than 10% of the whole cross sections. And then you have 10 travel lanes. The vision with the use of the autonomous vehicles, so we're looking, uh, LA plans to reduce the share of these uh, solo drivers to so from 70% to let's say 25% by 2035. So we looked at how the street, this cross section could change with this technology. So what we saw is that the capacity of bringing trips per hour uh, could triple or, or, or 2.5, let's say, could uh, duplicate uh, and a bit more even, even so, only dedicating uh, three lanes to, to vehicles that if they were shared, it would even, so instead of one person in the vehicle with four, that would increment the capacity more and, and putting tra tra dedicated transit lane, lanes, which I think that's the key that could be implemented in New York and in a place like Manhattan, where you could have um, like a BRT but aut automatized with a headway every two minutes and with, uh, but the, the key is the right of way. So you could have like a train, but in the shape of a bus in a, in a, in a street like it could be Fifth Avenue, in that case it was Wiltshire Boulevard. What, what the consequence of that is that you're freeing a lot of space that right now is dedicated to, to travel lanes, to, to vehicles. So you could have more bike lanes, you could have um, more furniture on the street, wider sidewalks, and then you would be increasing the capacity for pedestrians and bicyclists. So basically that was what we saw. And that's, that's what could be applied here. So when I think of autonomous vehicles in New York, I think that would be one option just these dedicated corridors that with a dedicated right of way, and that would be the city who manages the streets that would have a, a key role on that. Or then, and, and then allowing only shared vehicles. So by having not only one driver occupying the space of a car, you would, you would say, okay, you can come here, but this needs to be occupied by four or five people at least. And I'm gonna leave it like. Interesting. So Sabina, yeah. taking from that, since Bureau Happel has literally run, I think, what, 14, 15 at last count, uh, uh, workshops around the world bringing together architects, automakers, all, uh, city officials, state officials here in New York um, to imagine specific intersections. So I was part of a team in the New York one imagining Columbus Circle. And it was interesting. What did we do? We, we extended Central Park into the circle. We shrank the lane space. We closed uh, Broadway to pedestrians. And it was, or to everything but pedestrians, and it was great. And it also struck me as completely impractical. So I'm curious if, you know, if that was the pattern that played out here. When, that, when given carte blanche, we imagine these great green pedestrianized cities, but do we have any means of actually implementing that? Because that's Bureau Happel's work. Yeah, I, I think we, we started these workshops with the kind of the premise, um, autonomous um, vehicles have all these good characteristics, and so how can we reclaim the space? And so everyone, it was so interesting to see because everyone like reimagined any space we took, if it was Columbus Circle or the East Village or Greenpoint here in New York, as this kind of like really amazing public space. But then one of the, the questions every team had to answer, so how you go about it? How do you actually make it happen? Because it's easy to reimagine how the place could be, I think everyone, kind of certainly here in this room wants to have more green space, more walkability, more space for, so kind of turning the, the hierarchy from the car as on the top, turning it around and having the pedestrian on the top. And so it really, I think, when you have to think about how, how you do, go about to do this, then the kind of more difficult discussions came, <laughs> came up in the group and, and so, like it, it became clear you can't just reimagine it, you have to regulate the, 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 the CAVs, the, the connected and autonomous vehicles, and you have to start actually pricing it, um, pricing the right of way. And it was so interesting to see the difference between um, the workshops here in New York or, or in the US and, and workshops in Berlin and London. And London, I thought, was, was, was really interesting because London lived with congestion pricing for the last, I think, 10 almost years almost? Almost 20 years now. Or 15 almost years. 20, yeah. 15 years. And 
everyone in the group, everyone was convinced that's the only way to go about it. Because they lived it, they've seen it, and they think it's a good thing. And in none of the other cities, like, I was surprised in Berlin, like, they really defended their public transit system because they believe that it's a good system and it works, but they didn't want to implement any contestant pricing. So it, it's really kind of, and I think one lesson I learned, and I, I leave it at that, is like, I think piloting things seem to kind of be a good idea because people see that it might work, actually. So, so that's kind of like um, where I leave it. Thank you. I would say, well, it, it's interesting that we, you know, we have a dress rehearsal for how AVs will act in cities, and it's called Uber and Lyft. It's called ride hailing. Um, you know, only a couple years ago, of course, in 2015, Mayor de Blasio tried to cap them or wrangle them, and there was no political will for it. Um, in the last few years, Bruce Schaller, who's former Deputy Transportation Commissioner, again, I think from the Bloomberg administration, has published several reports showing that, you know, that Uber and Lyft are adding hundreds of millions of miles traveled to New York City streets, is adding congestion, is slowing down our buses, and that, his latest report, finally gave the mayor the impetus to act to cap the ride-hailing uh, services, which was roundly denounced by everybody as a blunt force measure, and even Uber and Lyft and Via and the others have come out and saying, we want congestion pricing. So I guess, Shinpei, since I think you probably have the deepest policy background up here on this one, I'll, I'll give this to you, which is, because uh, it's almost a policy and a culture question. You know, we've had tried to have two attempts at congestion pricing here in New York, one under Bloomberg and one under Cuomo most recently, and they both failed. Um, how do we change the culture of, of our cars, and, and how do we change the policy to make that happen there? I mean, you're, in both of your hats, you've tried to tackle these. Oh, yeah, it's a really, really good question. And actually, I was, um, I was actually thinking about this a little bit, because you know, in a lot of the renderings that um, these great workshops and all these different practitioners and automakers have come together to pull together, there's a, you can see that there's a whole variety of vehicles on the street. And, that actually, in, in, as a concept in itself, is, is, is going to be um, a flashpoint, I think, for the advocates who are working on bicycle pedestrian advocacy and um, the other side, you know, the, um, the traditional conflict between that, those, that, those groups and the, maybe like the pro-car folks. Um, I actually think that there's a huge, opportunity to create a coalition uh, to advocate for more space for the non-polluting, um, smaller footprint, more shared um, vehicles at, at, in support of congestion pricing as a way to then fund public transit, uh, the entire system. Um, and we can do that now. Before it was sort of a fight, it was, a, as you put it, it was a culture, it was a cultural war in a way. Mm -hmm because the, the uses were so stark. And, it's, and even though you know, Gil is absolutely right, we're all pedestrians, we all walk, um, we all start our trips with a walk, very few people identify themselves as pedestrians. Um, but now that there, are the, there is so much investment, and yes, it's coming from the private sector, but there, is, there are you know, um, clear uses for these short trips and these different modes. Um, there's, I think, this opportunity to diversify that coalition and to recognize that you know, some of these new vehicles are providing services for maybe the mobility, people who need um, help um, actually even walking around, people who can't ride bicycles, um, maybe for um, the elderly who you know, want to move at a slower speed, and I think all of that works together. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting about how, you know, again, how, how we change the culture on this, and I'm curious designs, Adam, because I know you've worked on stuff of imagining car sharing services and thinking about sort of the service design of this too. So I recently uh, attended a dinner where, I guess we're under Chatham House, so I can't say exactly who it was, but someone who had done public policy for one of the big ride-hailing, ride-sharing services had now switched to public policy for one of the scooter companies and bicycle companies, and she admitted that all of their efforts to basically convince people to do shared rides, they were wrong. They, you, you couldn't get people to do it. They didn't want to give up private, and, uh, private vehicles, and so now we should just give them all scooters, and that would fix it, I guess. Um, but I thought that was a really interesting admission that perhaps either they know this isn't going to happen or that they may have been wrong in their assumptions. So I'm curious to have you particular thoughts on this and what you've seen and thinking about, you know, how do we redesign or tailor these mobility services? People have talk, talked about mobility as a service. Like, we can imagine, you know, memberships across multiple modes, things like this. Um, you know, with autonomous vehicles, is there a way to, we can design this or we just don't, 
own an AV? Is it, are we gonna just put, make all the buses autonomous and all the scooters autonomous? Or how, how do we think about actually folding them into our environments versus you know, what we saw, I think, in Gil's slide of just pod cars that are stuck in traffic while the cyclists go by? I think that's, that's a great um, uh, sort of challenge that we need to deal with today. We basically have a kind of mobility revolution going on, and it's not just about autonomous vehicles. It's, you know, shared, it's connected, um, and it's uh, electric as well. And, and, and then finally you have scale to size. And that's really um, something as we try and think sensitively about our cities, we want to think about the, the ability to scale our mobility to uh, what we're putting our feet into or sitting in uh, according to where we need to go. And, and so this idea that we start to structure our right of way and our streetscapes that really um, is sort of modeled to uh, those long journeys where you may have stuff with you, uh, and then those short journeys where you're able to stand up and you're you're just going you know five or six blocks or ten blocks. That I think you know uh, represents a great challenge, um, and I think looking at at that mobility revolution in relationship to essentially what's a kind of land use. Uh, revolution too, which is that you know retail is really struggling, uh, and so figuring out how we want our streets uh, to look and how much need there is for some of those other land uses, bringing those things uh, together is going to really help us address like you know the different ways of um, sharing or the different incentives or sticks involved in getting people out of cars and onto scooters and onto bikes. So there's a real need to look at the, at the problem in a kind of more holistic way, and then the models will start to emerge from that. And I think, you know, on the policy side, you're seeing in places like New Rochelle where they've incentivized uh, car share spaces in new development so that, you know, they're disincentivizing overbuilding parking you know, trying to really push those kind of policies um, that wind up reinforcing, you know, the different kinds of journeys that we're taking and, and the kind of activity we want to see on our streets. One question for, the, for, for any of you, if you've done particular work in suburban environments, so looking beyond just the five boroughs or even looking at the less dense parts of the five, bureau, five boroughs, um, I, was, I had a call this morning actually with Jan LaRiche, who's the CEO of Tronstev North America. They have, if you've ever seen the red autonomous shuttles, um, they're working on a project in suburban Florida, exurban Florida, called Babcock Ranch, which is, you know, one of those master plan developments rising from the swamps but they want to make it completely energy sustainable, so it's only solar power, uh, and then no one owns a car on the campus, it's all autonomous shuttles there. And um, yeah, we were talking about the, the, whether this could transform suburbia as well. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts about, you know, can we make suburbia more sustainable if we deploy autonomous vehicles correctly, or is this, you know, what's the appropriate scale? Uh, Adam, you're nodding, if you want to expand upon that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a great opportunity to, to get people excited about living in car-free environments. And that's, you know, and, and it starts with, again, how we want to live and what we want to see happen at the ground plane. And so if that's playgrounds and playing fields and, and, and active spaces, then certainly finding a way to remove the vehicles um, and allow for uh, those kinds of, you know, connect scooter and bike connections to places where AVs are pooled. Um, then, then, yeah, I think, but I think it starts with putting the investments into those, into those, uh, you know, alternative ground level spaces that will get people really excited. No. Just, Please go if ahead. If I can just add, I mean, I, I, I uh, there was some, t uh, some research I did a few years ago that looked at these r more suburban rural spaces, especially with ride hailing services and, um, I think what's interesting to me is it's not the automated technology necessarily that is going to make or break this in terms of suburban areas. It's, it's the destinations and the places we create and, and to maybe um, really think about right-sizing them for the context so it's not imposing in a, you know, a completely urban setting into those areas, but, but really providing the amenities where people can have places to go and do those things, to do all those things to live their daily lives. But it's not the automation necessarily, I, you know, and I really wonder about that part of it. I think it's the electrified aspect that might help with the environment because there will be VMT no matter what. 
Um, maybe there's a little bit of um, car ownership reduction, perhaps, but honestly, with a suburban rural area, people will need a vehicle mm -hmm. um, to get around. And there's potential, I think, to rethink transit agencies in those areas to provide more right size, less fuel dependent um, shared trips. Um, and, and I think that's maybe where there's potential. That, that there were a few pilots around that idea and they were, um, the trans agencies were basically subsidizing Uber and Lyft rides. I, and there were some, you know, kind of like chariot kind of um, services. It's all, I think, still to be determined whether, you know, I think the destination was re is really important. They were just, pick they were only delivering people to a Walmart, for example. So, I, yes, you know. Yes, that's Waymo's initial pilot. Right. You know, order so, something at Walmart, and then we'll drive you to Walmart and everybody to pick it up from yeah. Walmart. So it's just, you know, I think Adam's absolutely right. The land use and, you know, where, where are we bringing people, where are we picking them up is really, really important. All right, so let's spin forward from there, and let's talk about for a moment, what are your worst case scenarios? What are your nightmares, each of you, when you think through this? And I'll, I'll, I'll short circuit. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take two as moderator's privilege. Number one, the number one nightmare scenario that comes up whenever I, when I've, in work I've done for Intel and others is Wally. -E. Wally -E is the nightmare vision of very large people in autonomous chairs with a screen strapped to your face selling you ads. Like, this is the worst <laughs> scenario that comes up. And the other one I think about too is, and this gets into it, is we've talked so far about vehicles, and we're talking mostly about cars, or we think of car shape. But we've also seen tests of delivery bots around the country too, which use sidewalks. So Starship is under tests in Washington, D.C. What happens when we're being forced off our sidewalks because columns of delivery bots are going by on this, and other ways of, of, of taking over the street space? So you know, one solution there is we price it, in which case we now price the street, the curb, the sidewalk. Is there anything we don't take a toll on kind of thing? We can start to see how policies and permissions get quickly out of whack. So I'm curious what, what you most fear of what could happen with AVs, right? I mean, with cars, we knock down neighborhoods and built highways through the middles of our cities. What's the AV equivalent, I guess, if this goes wrong? I, I want to say in regards to pricing and the world. So I, there's a moment where we'll need to put the price of the public space, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, the, especially, and I come back to, here to New York, I mean, the, the, the space is limited and it has a lot of demand. So everybody wants to be here. A lot of pedestrians, a lot of bicycle, uh, bicyclists, a lot of um, mm, private vehicles, and a lot of deliveries, right? So the worst scenarios we've, we've seen is, okay, everybody with, the, with the, its own bubble there driving, you know, occupying a lot of space, not being regulated, and so on. The other thing are the e-commerce. How do we manage the curve? So the curb right now, a lot of things happens in the curb. You, you just go outside uh, Broadway. Well, Broadway is protected, so let's put another bike lane, but you, a lot of things, so you have the bike lane, you have deliveries, you have someone with the iPhone there, or, or iPhone, just smartphone, or just, so curb is so, it has a lot of pride. I mean, it's so valuable, the curve. The autonomous vehicles, well, they can, it can be a, like a chaos, but it's also a chance to organize these deliveries, right? So the first, uh, if someone delivers a pen to you, this should cost a lot of money. So deliveries should be organized so that you bring as much as possible, that you do the shortest route, and that there's some spots, just some spaces dedicated to that. And because they will, they will, will be autonomous, they will be organized. So let's say when we didn't have computers, we had to do everything, it was a bit of a mess, and the, Computers have helped us just do things faster and more organized. So while it can be a chaos, I think the policies, everything, there's a chance here to organize the curve. Um, we talked about, so there previously in the, in the presentation, we talked about the, the reduction of the demand of parking. So we all these, which if there's no policy, it can be a disaster, let's say. With, uh, if the, the city anticipates how to organize all that, this is a great opportunity to, to basically win space for other modes and to have a more, just like, to, to manage the curve more efficiently. Yeah. Sabina. So I think my, my, my worst case scenario is like that we, that we don't kind of um, take this opportunity really and I, I see that just like we, we can't it, it seems a lot of things we can't make happen because all all these things that we're talking about could happen today we yeah, don't need to no wait to wait for the autonomous vehicle to have to make it happen and, and and so I think my worst case scenario is really that, that it doesn't happen <laughs> that we let this kind of moment of window of opportunity pass 
and the technology companies, they're acting very fast, they have their own interests. Um, like if it's the technology or the car manufacturer, it doesn't really matter. But, but so the public policy kind of is, is, is slow. And so my worst case scenario is really that we're not, <laughs> we can't make it happen. Well, at least we're, not, at least we're in, a, in a mode now where it's not doing nothing. It's a question of are they doing enough? Because you know, we've got the cap on ride hailing here and, you know, and, and shared streets is doing pick up and drop. But we're starting to see some first tentative movements in cities around the country to get a handle on this. The scooters, the bane of our existence now, are like really the sort of the test, the, the, the test bed here on, on how do we regulate this stuff. I mean, what, what would you like to see, Sabina? What, like, what, what's, the, what's the ideal way of regulating? Uh, like pricing. I think, I think we do regulate pricing. And I don't think the argument of like having these uh, people who, who can't afford kind of their commute into Manhattan is, is an argument. There's not enough of these um, people who actually do that. Mm -hmm. And with pricing, we can, we can, if we have the money, we can offer alternatives. I think that's, yeah. yeah. Sorry, with, that's, with what you get with pricing, you put that to transit or yeah. to the alternatives most. It's some, one system fits the others. Exactly. Do I get my worst case you, scenario? You do get your, before you do that quick, Adam. It's so I, much I, more fun it, to do worst we, case scenario. We are taking <laughs> questions up here. I say I might need some technical assistance because I think this might be timing out over and over. But please do contribute questions if you have the, uh, the Tyler device here. Maybe someone can check on it for me. But Adam, in the meantime, so what's two, your worst case? Two, two worst case scenarios. So just on this question of regulation, and you raised it when you spoke in the beginning, which is this other side, which is regulating behavior in the public realm, which is this fear that people have that, you know, vehicles that are autonomous and pedestrians and cyclists aren't communicating with each other. And so there's an effort made to essentially uh, foster that communication in ways that regulates behavior in the public realm. Obviously, the, the desire for regulating and, and adding pricing to it is important, but this idea that, you know, in order to facilitate the flow of autonomous vehicles, you need to control the way people are in the public realm uh, is a real fear. You know, what will stop people from walking in front of cars, you know, when they're autonomous and they're trained to stop uh, for pedestrians? So the flip side of that is, is the control piece. I think the, the other piece of it is that, you know, we are able to reduce right-of-way space for vehicles um, and then there's no way to fund and finance uh, and do what we want to do in that, in that other space. And uh, I think earlier presentations talked about the maintenance challenge mm -hmm. and uh, you know, really having the space and you know, if all the cars are electric, you know, how are we paying you know, for infrastructure repair when it's previously come through a gas tax, you know, how are we taking care of that space? Who's responsible for it? You know, does it become um, uh, more of a wasteland than a, than a real opportunity space? No. Champagne and nightmares to offer? Or, well, I'll, or I can turn around to you is, and the next question I have is, and your perfect pivot is this, is what are some of the best case scenarios we can think on this is too? How do we, how do we get to, or, or how can we expand upon some of the visions there? Because one of the things that comes out of this, and I want, this is my cue to ask you about the National Street Service, um, is you know, the notion that the street, the streets of New York are something between, I've seen estimates between 30 and 80% of our public space, or any given city, the street is public space. And there's this opportunity here that with AVs, we can, of course, we can narrow the lane space. We can you know, basically shunt them, we can reprogram them. Um, one vision of how, what we can do with this is, again, Sidewalk Labs, uh, their project in Toronto, they're working with Carla Roddy from MIT to literally create a programmable street, a robot that will flip over tiles. So the morning commute that's asphalt or rubber can then be turned over into wood and it can turn into a play space during the day, um, literally reprogramming the street. And then, yeah, and, then, and Gail, of course, has another great program called the National Street Service, which I hope you talk a bit about, which is literally getting communities to think about what other things streets could be. So, so how do we take what Marichal worked on with and, and what Nelson Nygaard worked on about reallocating the street space to rethinking the street completely in the age of AV? Well, I think you guys, um, you offer really great, I think, best case scenarios where if you had all the right regulation in the, in the you know, endless political will um, and um, civic pride and shared spaces, um, those things would, you know, those things would happen. And, and I think that last piece of um, really feeling vested in our public realm um, and, uh, you know, I was ready with my nightmare with, around that because oh, I actually, <laughs> I actually feel like that's probably where I, I have the greatest worry is that we've been so good at making people invisible from our public realm 
in so many different ways, and this conversation is really the, the money and the, um, you know, kind of the fast moves are really being driven by the vehicle side of things and not necessarily by um, the um, kind of the best public interests. And we still haven't solved a lot of these management ma maintenance issues. Um, I think the culture, um, the cultural piece, which is, you know, the regulation that's required, there's this huge, um, sentiment against regulation right now, right? Like that's, I think there's this um, attachment of like, there's greater independence with autonomous vehicles because you can have your vehicle and do whatever you want. But actually what we're seeing in these, in these best case scenarios is that there's ever more regulation. We need a ton more regulation actually in order for this to be done well. Um, and relatedly, um, you know, there's, these technologies are being created with potentially implicit bias because of who their creators are. And so I think the cultural piece, which is related to the National Street Service, uh, Greg mentioned this project that the Gale Practice um, and Gale Institute, my organization, helped on, which is really to test, to see how we can change public sentiment around their street, around street, and, and on an individual level, not on a not on a, let's say, community group level, on a person-to-person -person level. What would it take for people to feel a greater connection to the spaces around them, to feel like they are, you know, they have say over their sidewalks, to feel like they're, um, they have a way of shaping their neighborhoods. Um, and, and so we, we had, also, we had uh, the project that the practice pulled together was um, to create urban street rangers. They did all sorts of creative engagement um, where they asked, you know, they, they talked to drivers, um, they talked to people in the street, they, they priced um, amenities in the street to show how, just how valuable, how much we actually take our public spaces for granted. Um, and, and you know, in a way to try to get people to see if, the, if we can move the dial uh, around our shared spaces. That's really what we're talking about. It's not just the street, it's everything. And we're talking about making more space for it to be shared in a multitude of different ways. Yeah, so this is the thing. All this thing comes back to me, as I mentioned at the very top of this, and Marichal touched upon this too in describing the, 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 the Wilshire work, is that almost everything we've talked about here, autonomous vehicles are not necessary to this vision. All of the changes we can make in cities, all the things we can do to improve it, the technology of autonomy is almost completely unnecessary. It's again, it's, it's almost like we're talking about magic or spiritual forces appropriate here in St. Bartholomew's, <laughs> but this notion of that there is this animating mystical force that gives us permission to talk about these changes of this. And this is what I think is so interesting about the AV conversation. So I finally got some, I got my questions up from the audience here and thank you for contributing. I wanna, I, there is one that's, that's near and dear to my heart here. Um, you know, again, I think I t touched upon this earlier, but why is there so much focus on AVs and not motorcycles, pedal assist, bicycles, et cetera? Why is the focus on four wheel boxes? So since none of us here are vehicle designers, Let's be urbanists playing at vehicle designers for a moment. And what would your ideal AV be like? What, what would be the game-changing form of the autonomous thing or service that goes beyond a bicycle or a bus or any of this? I mean, so I'll give you my example to answer this question is, is I think the most interesting evolution of what the scooter, the electric bike could be, given the fact that people like Bird and Lime and all those services, which we cannot have here in New York, at least not in Manhattan, um, is that they're evolving out of Chinese electronics manufacturers. So the people who build the iPhone are the ones who are now building these vehicles, which means they're going to evolve much more quickly than cars ever did or can do these days. So I want to imagine a lightweight electric sit-down bicycle or scooter that I can summon on my phone that will pedal up in a bike lane that I can get in and ride in for two miles at 20 miles an hour and get out without breaking a sweat or ever being in danger because I've been in a protected bicycle lane. Things like that, thank you. Someone seems to like that. Obviously I should pedal it now and then. But I'm curious if we thought about what could these services be like? Because there's autonomous school buses now. Uh, a Transdev has launched one in Florida where there's a caregiver instead of a driver. Um, we can do this with, dis with disabled, with elderly. Um, does anyone have a particular thoughts about what a, a, an ideal autonomous vehicle or service could be for someone that would really add value to our communities? Sabina. Uh, okay. Or Marichal, sorry, I, 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 who's nodding first? <laughs> Um, I think it depends really on the context and the yes. kind of density, um, because a one person, whatever it is, if it's a, a protected scooter or so, um, will still take up space in, in, on a Manhattan kind of sidewalk or curb or, or a street. So I think 
in, in a high density area, you want to actually have buses that, are, that, that can carry the high density you need. In a, in a more rural suburban area where it's about connecting to the last mile, first mile, um, it's maybe a shuttle because you have enough density for a six place shuttle bus. Um, or you need a kind of single person one for the very last because in, in a kind of um, suburban Montreal like area you might not want to go out in winter um, to go to the next bus stop. So it really depends on the context I think that's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, you stole my response. But, 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 no, no, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to just basically second that. I mean, um, here as I mentioned before I see these buses that, or buses or type of transit would look like a BRT, LRT that could, with high capacity, uh, uh, that could, they could uh, work 24 seven. I mean, right, you don't have the labor costs. You can, there be other costs, but I mean, without the labor costs, you, you're capable to increase the headway and to expand the hours of operation. It could be so attractive for, at certain corridors, you cannot have that in all the streets, but this could help the east-west connectivity here, which is kind of weak in, this, uh, in, in terms of high capacity, or either supplement some metro lines that subway that are at capacity, right? So this is, this, this is something that could work here in New York. And when I think of the outer boroughs, there are some areas which are not served by subway. subway. So these some small shuttles that could serve uh, as far as last mile or outside the city that they could take people to, to transit, that would be the, my, um, I think that would be great. And, and then I would also would love to have my, my vehicle, private vehicle, but just that occupies like a bike or a scooter to do these two mile trips. Mm -hmm. I'd like to replace accessor ride. I think, I think that would be a win-win. Yeah. A for everyone. And I think, I, um, I think even the people who have to, you know, um, make use of it on demand. A, a much smaller vehicle is, not, you know, you don't need that gigantic white box to come and pick you up. Um, that might be, I think that system could be, you know, replaced immediately. Yeah, I think we'd all agree that having a diversity of uh, size and shapes for different challenges and uses and densities would make sense. One thing just from the, the right-of-way perspective, um, <clears throat> if you start to create a huge range of widths, it gets more complicated. And one of the things, we've tried to do things with the Department of Transportation, like green loading zones, mm -hmm. carving out space at the curbside for electric trucks. And, um, and what we found is that there's pushback. Whenever you start to carve out for unique uh, widths or sizes or types of vehicles, that it can create real inefficiencies. So, you know, capturing those different kinds of autonomous vehicles in like clear widths so you can really establish, you know, how they flow uh, is one of the challenges. And so, you know, you're probably not going to want 10 different vehicles of 10 different widths with 10 different kinds of lanes. Yeah. So there will be some, some need to like think about how that sets itself up in the, in the right of way. So question one, there's several questions in the queue here about really about sort of the politics of this, making sure that AVs are not only for the wealthiest residents of New York City or cities in general as well, um, which ties a little bit about, you know, some of the congestion pricing rhetoric that Sabine alluded to earlier. Um, but I mean, dwelling on this practically for a moment, I guess, Shinpei, I'll pick on you again, because Transit Center and the work on this is, I mean, we know nationwide, I just saw a transit, I just saw your colleagues just published a report that like 31 of 30, the 35 largest American cities are seeing declines in transit ridership. People are switching to cars. Car ownership is rising in New York City as we speak. Um, so how do we make sure, how, will we, how do we actually go about ensuring that when autonomous services are real here in New York, they're not being run as private ride hailing or ride sharing services by Uber or Lyft or Ford or GM or Waymo, but that are actually being run by the city and are being dictated by the city's public policy goals. So there are autonomous buses run by the city or contracted by the city. Um, does anyone have any particular thoughts on how do we get them to play nicely with the city we have versus trying to subvert us, which is what's happened with a lot of these private services when they come to New York? Well, I think um, thinking about some of the things we have today where there are services not run by the city but are serving more marginalized communities where there are there's less transportation thinking about the dollar vans um, and there may be ways where services like that which promote uh, local entrepreneurship uh, could work more closely together with the city and you know certainly seeing 
the way Chariot has come into the city versus some of these uh, dollar van services that have been running for many years and oftentimes link up with, with public transit as a, a kind of end destination. There may be some things there that we want to consider as, as models as well. Yeah, I just would like to add, so there's, um, I think that it's important that so the autonomous vehicles can be a piece of, of, of so at the end it's, we want to provide we want to make alternative modes um, attractive, and it's about giving the, so we haven't talked about the mobility as a service. Is it, so this, these things are happening. Uh, Finland is a great example of that. So the way I see here in New York, so it's like, so there's the need for like a big umbrella that manages everything. It can, it, it can be the city, it can be the transit operator, but so it's about giving the people the options for going from a point A to point B and make them easier uh, with uh, chaining all the different modes. So let's say this could be, this would be great. The autonomous vehicles could do the first last mile portion of neighborhoods that are not, um, they don't have the resources for that. And, and so, and they would ease uh, this uh, chain to just bring them to transit and then from transit to bike and then from bike to something. So it's about, Managing that globally, it's, it's looking at that uh, not as different operators or different um, yeah, services, but just one. And the autonomous vehicle should be allowed to, to be part of this chain, right? Like as a shared vehicle to help people arrive from point A to point B. Well, I, and I, I think Finland is a really good example of that holistic approach, but um, just it really underscores this question because I think the monthly subscription is like six hundred dollars no, right now. Four hundred ninety-nine euros. No, so this, euros. So yeah. This is, this is all, all you can eat travel in, no, in Helsinki or Singapore is doing it as well too. So Phil, they give you the option so to to pay uh, if you're a rider that an occasional rider you will pay for one day unlimited ride, but but. This price that you're talking, it's, it's, it's 500, can, it's all you can, yeah. it's unlimited rights for all a month. Ride. And what they tell you is, okay, owning a car costs you this amount of money. So why don't you, instead of dedicating this amount of money to owning a car, why don't you use all these array of services that are managed? You just by clicking that, you can go from, again, you can do your trip and you can do unlimited rides with all these transportation modes that are coordinated. It just, it just costs you that. I mean, just if I can right. just, put, you know, just put a sharper point on that. I totally agree with you about providing the alternative modes. And in fact, I would say that that's where the investment really needs to go, is to these areas where they don't have these transit options right now, especially the really high quality um, types of services. Right now, I think the technology companies are, um, as they enter the market, they're looking at the, um, they're looking at, I think, really popular kind of routes where it's high, you know, high destination, you know, the job centers, right? Yeah. Um, they may not be thinking about those who are, um, you know, handling like multiple jobs throughout the day, the, the non-job trips, which are actually, I think, a huge portion of our daily trips, right? So I think like thinking about building up infrastructure around that. And so the holistic approach, absolutely. And then thinking about it as a right for the citizen in the city to be able to have that trip rather than providing the option and that, um, to really make it a right. Well, I would say if we had hour two here, we would get into, uh, my favorite idea is taking that further is the new notion that people are touting is universal basic mobility. So instead of universal basic income, the city should guarantee a right of this. Estonia has granted free public transport starting in Tallinn, the capital, and now through the entire country. Now there's advocates that we should combine all these modes and create uh, universal basic mobility, which I'm a total fan of. And then we could also get into, uh, that would replace, hopefully replace all the jobs that automation will destroy, which also came up several times in the queue. Thank you for an excellent question, which we'll save for another day. Um, applause for all of my panelists. Thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure.